Hi, uh, thanks for coming over here. It's great to see all of you. As you can see, I've been completely barricaded, so I can't move. <laughs> no escape plan for me. Um, so I'm going to quickly introduce myself. So my name is Tanya Vakada. I'm an Agile coach and XR Startups Consultant. I'm also an award-winning designer and an ambassador for women in immersive technologies and a lead for women who code. When it comes to cybersecurity, what do I and cybersecurity have in common? Well, over 70 years of working in information securities with Allstate as a project manager. So I work with people. So naturally, I am interested in the human factor and creative technologies as well. When I say the human factor, I mean all aspects of our behavior, decision-making, communication that affects our daily lives, um, whether it's work or relationship, especially work. I'm also into snowboarding a lot, and a lot of reading, lots of books, as you will see in this presentation. And here is a car called my LinkedIn page if you'd like to stay connected. So today I want to ask you a question. Please raise your hand if you trust your intuition. There's some delay at the back. Okay, so good to see there are people who trust their intuition. I wonder if those who did not raise their hand have a thought. Is it a good thing or bad thing? So um, let's get back to that question later. Another question, how well do you trust your intuition? Does it help you in your life situations, at work, in a relationship, on the road? When I was learning to drive, my driving instructor, William, used to tell me that my safety on the road was in the hands of the last idiot driving next to me. Although he used the word idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, we'll have control over our lives, reactions, and behavior. But what he meant is that I should never overestimate what I know about the world, uh, the world and what I see on the road. And never underestimate the, um, the role of chance, the role of uncertainty, and the irrationality of human behavior. He actually demanded that I pay attention to what I don't know. And never, never ignore the likelihood of the most ridiculous scenario happening. Perhaps not as ridiculous as this one, but how about a car suddenly changing lanes right in front of you without having a light indicator on, forcing you to hit the brakes? Has happened? Um, maybe you were the one driving? <laughs> but I'm sure some of you can predict such behavior before it happens. Somehow you know who's going to be that idiot on the road and who's going to behave this way so you can prepare in advance. If you think about driving, the more experienced the driver, the more driving is done without thinking. Think about it. When you drive your kids to and from uh, school, when you go to work or shopping, and if you think back about your trip, most likely you're not going to remember much and you're not going to remember how you did it. That's because the more experience we get, the more skill is built into our intuitive system and we drive on autopilot. We don't think about it. It becomes easy and intuitive. But what happens if we come across a situation we don't recognize, something new? For example, driving in the night, um, at night time in a fog, or driving in a new city. Think about it. We suddenly become alert and vigilant. We focus on what we don't know. We sharpen our attention and start searching for all the signs of what might happen because we expect the high likelihood of an accident or something unexpected taking place. And this is called aware driving. Here, I'm going to uh, ask you another question. So, who do you think is a better driver? An intuitive driver or an aware driver? Aware driver. Oh, maybe in series of let's see. So these are the stats for road accidents contributing factors in the UK 2020. I know you can't read it, so I'm going to read you the top, um, the most contributing factor, about 40%. Driver failed to look properly. Second contributing factor, about 20%. Driver failed to judge other person's path or speed. Third one, driver careless, reckless, or in a hurry. And the list goes on. Most of these reasons are associated with um, errors of judgment and poor attention. So this shows that our reliance on intuition is not always a good thing. And when it comes to cybersecurity, there is no exception. 
This is the IBM Safety Security Intelligence Report for 2021. And they found that in 95%, the cause of cybersecurity breach was the human factor. That means that if the human factor was mitigated, only one out of 20 breaches would take place. Only one out of 20. So here is a question. When does trust in our intuition is the thing? And when does it lead to accidents? So to make it a bit interesting, I'm going to share my story with you. And to give an example. So last year, I have um, I had a team of people working on a new e-commerce website for my personal project. And we used Wix Editor, where I have another website, current website, with all my customer information. And about May time, we started testing new subscribers and membership forms. So every day I was getting tons of notifications about new subscribers being added. So one Sunday morning, because only people who own business work on Sunday mornings, I got another notification. Um, there was nothing wrong about this one. If that happened on any other day, I would not pay much attention to it. But that morning, something made me pause. So I had a look at it. And what I found was quite interesting. The subscriber's email and their registration email addresses were different. That maybe checked some other information on the website within my Wix edit page, and I found that the subscriber somehow also edited himself as a site member um, to my website, getting access to my admin page, bypassing my sign-up protocol approval form. I didn't receive that notification. And there were four more other site members who just invite, invited themselves to my website without my permission. So the first thing I did, I reached out to the project manager to see if that was uh, part of the test. Of course, it was not, because people don't work on Sundays, right? So at this point, I panicked. My adrenaline in my blood just went through the roof. I was sweating. Because on my website, I have custom information. I have emails, names, addresses. I have my bank details, my credit cards, all linked to payments. It's the commerce website. And I have my corporate. I dealt with costs before. It's a very painful process. So at this moment, I, I just absolutely panicked. What do you do? I can't see the IP address. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if it's just one off or it's going to repeat. So then my logical mind kicked in and I started taking action. Well, first, screenshots. Take note of the time when it happens. Um, take screenshots of all the credentials and details. Then block fake emails, remove our site members, and send a report to Wix security. And I set an alarm to check my notifications every hour. And it was all good until the next morning when I got 15 new site members just inviting themselves to my um, website admin page, and so we continued. I was blocking, moving, taking screenshots, sending daily reports to Wix, um, which is super important as well. Um, next day, I would say 15, 20, 25, at some point, it was several thousands of emails. Um, I must say, the guy, the girl, they, they were really creative. So here is an example of that creativity. I don't know if you can see this. But that day, all emails, uh, the topic was casinos. And every day was a different topic. So someone was really having fun there. All of these emails, they absolutely did glass mumbo jumbo. So you can see they were automated, they were auto generated. What I also observed, most of the attacks happened in the morning time, but not at the same time. It wasn't consistent and not every day. And there was this exponential nature to our relationship that at some point even made me think that wasn't really automated and might be some manual elements involved. Um, so finally, after my daily reports to Wix, I replied with this email, please be sure that this is simply automated spam and your website and account are safe and secure. We're currently investigating this and working alongside our security and development team to stop the fake site members from being added to this. This did not calm me down. I was worried and I was worried a lot. And the reason for this, in 2020, Interpol cybersecurity report revealed that the top cybersecurity attack form was spam messages. Just in the first four months of 2020, there were over 900,000 spam messages sent that 
resulted in theft of information, money, extortion, sometimes just for fun. But you know what? It might have been for fun, but as a small business owner, the last thing I really wanted to say is my business name appear on some spam messages, possibly even sent to my clients. When you build a business and your business reputation over years with blood and sweat and lots of money and lots of effort, the last thing you want is to see one idiot ruin it all in one day. And this is a very scary thought. So I didn't agree with this and I didn't want to take chances. Um, so I thought, what else can I do? From my end, right? So I reached out to clients of mine with who I have good relationships and I asked them to monitor their emails, uh, whatever comes out, just see if something happens. I notified all clients and subscribers um, who I had that, like, um, whose details I had on the website because they have the right to know. I notified my banks um, for all the cards that were reached on my website and I removed most of the card details from the website as well. I checked my security features and enabled those that were missing. And I also enabled two factor authentication for access to my uh, Wix admin page. Turns out I was a reckless driver too. So yeah, you need to have two factor authentication everywhere. And at this point, I was really happy that I had my business of professional indemnity insurance. I cannot understate how important it is because you really don't value it until it happens. And it can happen to anyone, anytime, with a simple spam message. Um, at this point, it was about a week since the first unauthorized signing happened. Those attacks, uh, attacks stopped. And I really want to think that was Wix who fixed this vulnerability, but I also know that other Wix users experienced this issue throughout the entire 2020, 2022. And an interesting fact, a few weeks after that, Someone tried to make payments in Sunny California using my credit card. I had this credit card details on my website. You know, that's the thing. So it might have been just for fun. It might have been just an innocent spam attack. Someone was trying to get access to my customer information. Who knows? But in business, just like in driving, you don't want to take chances. And going back to the topic of intuition. Right. It was my intuition and a bit of luck because I actually made do work to check my notifications on Sunday morning that helped me spot the attack. But it was my vigilance that helped me deal with it. You see, that's the thing. We actually drive better when we are aware of what we don't know, when we expect the unexpected. So, but we also know that in this case, intuition was a good thing. I followed through on it, but it doesn't always work. So what makes our intuition backfire sometimes, right? If we want to be better drivers, we need to know those factors. So let's look at what intuition is. So Herbert Simon, who studied chess masters and their claims and their behavior, claims that intuition is nothing more and nothing less than recognition. That's recognition done by our intuitive, automated thinking system using the knowledge about the world that we already have to quickly assess the situation and produce that quick and easy decision. We just get the final output, quick and easy one. So here I'm going to, I want you to do this. Oh, actually, let me see that one. So I'm going to give you a quick um, test just to test how fast, how quick your intuition is. So I'm going to show you that um, a simple math task, um, just a bit of a rule. Do not try to solve it, but just listen to your mind and listen to the first answer that comes to your mind. The first two seconds, what answer comes? You don't need to say it. So here it is. And you will get the first answer and response coming to your mind quick and easy because this is an easy puzzle. Um, some of you might get an answer that says tap, right? So this is quick puzzle. It calls for intuitive response, quick and wrong one. Because if you do the math, you will see that if a ball costs 10 p, then the total sum is going to be one pound and twenty. The right answer is five. Some of you who got the right answer also had this quick, tampy 
thought. It's intuitive. It comes to everyone's mind, but somehow you resisted it. And that's a good thing. Think about it. What helped you resist in your thought? Um, this tampy response is what scientists call um, a thought illusion or cognitive illusion. And the thing about them is no one is immune to them. We, even the best of us fall for them. If you got the answer wrong, don't worry, so did I when I came across this task. And actually, so did over 50% of Harvard, Princeton, and MIT University students. That's the thing about cognitive illusions. We all suffer from them. So, going back to intuition then, if intuition is recognition based on, on our knowledge about the world, and we know that our knowledge is limited, we simply don't know everything, right? Then it's intuition, oh, sorry, mix up, sorry. So, then intuition is something that tells you to check your facts. Right, the tenth response in, is intuitive, and some of you have overcome it when your aware driver kicks in and tells you, "Please check your path. It's not that like piece. Something is not adding up here." So, why do we fall for these illusions? Right? Why does it happen? Why do we suffer from them? So, first thing, it's easy. You see, we all rely on this intuitive, automated driving because it saves us energy, mental energy, and actually physical energy. This is how we work. 95% of our thinking is done intuitively without our conscious, aware thought. We rely on it. It's in our nature. Um, it is linked to the concept of the law of least effort. That's what psychologists suggest. The idea is that when there are several ways of achieving a sort of goal, people will eventually gravitate to the least demanding way. In other words, scientists claim that laziness is built in our nature. This is how our minds and bodies evolved. And that's why it gets so hard to overcome those thoughts or cognitive illusions. Factor number two, we suffer from overconfidence. Very often we overestimate what we know and underestimate what we don't know. This is called the illusion of knowing. And it is linked to another cognitive bias called the bias of certainty. The thing about it is when we strongly believe a certain conclusion is true, our minds will keep looking for the evidence that supports this conclusion, even if the evidence is unsound. In other words, we create the cognitive state of desired certainty at the expense of truth. And that leads us to another cognitive illusion, the illusion of control. We think we're in control because we think we know what we need to know about the world because we have this sense of certainty that we have created for ourselves so that we can go around the world comfortably. I know what I'm doing. Have you heard that? Very often it's said just before a disaster is going to happen. So if you go back to what intuition is again, I'm going to remind about this a lot. If it is our intuitive automated system response um, to the situation which uses the knowledge we already have about the world, then it's just a signal in the set to check the facts, take action and verify your facts mindfully. And it is when we start ignoring the signal or fail to take action, fail to do for the math, is when accidents happen. So let's try and formulate the safety law of an idiot, right? So we have established that it's overconfidence, what we think we know about the world, and low mental effort, our reliance on those easy, lazy thinking that leads to accidents. Then the, lo the safety law is going to be awareness about everything we don't know, the unexpected. Awareness of, about that driver, idiot driver on the road, somewhere driving next to you right now that you don't know about, plus focused mental effort and ability to quickly switch from intuitive autopilot driving thinking to focused mental effort thinking. That what makes us better drivers. So this is all good, right? But no one can maintain 
focused mental effort throughout the day 27. Because this is really difficult. You know that if you're working on a certain report, analyzing data of 45 minutes, and it's like, break. I'm exhausted. Um, sporting abnormalities, the unusual, requires this mental effort, and it is difficult. Attention is difficult. Right. So if we talk about attention being better drivers, we need to know the factors that deplete our attention. Um, here is an interesting fact. Our nervous system consumes more glucose than many other parts of our body. And some studies showed that demanding cognitive tasks, especially those that involve some form of self-control, can be as exhausting and glucose demanding as running a spring. So what are the factors that can deplete our attention and can make us switch from aware driving to autopilot driving? First, time pressure. Any task where you need to think quickly and fast under pressure is very uh, mentally demanding, one of the hardest. Next, I don't know if you can see that, switching between mentally demanding cognitive tasks, especially under time pressure or doing more than, uh, than one such task at a time, in other words, multitasking. So yes, scientists claim that we are not built for multitasking. In fact, when we start multitasking, we lose our focus. Um, another question, has anyone heard of the invisible gorilla experiment? So, okay. I'm going to show you. So, two um, scientists from Harvard University decided to test the effect of mentally demanding cognitive tasks on our attention. So, they made a video of six people passing a ball dynamically, three people in white shirts and three people in black shirts, and they asked the audience to silently count the number of passes. So, imagine that. You're sitting in the audience and you need to count those passes between the two teams, and they're very quick and rapid. And in the middle of the video, a man dressed as a gorilla walks in and stays on screen for nine seconds. Do you think you would see the gorilla man? Over 50% of the audience did not see the man. They completely missed it. They couldn't believe they didn't see the man. And that's the thing. That's what cognitive biases and illusions do to our minds. We can practically stare at things and just be blind. They practically make us blind. As the scientists showed on their website, and you can Google it, the videos um, on their website, it's very easy to find. We are missing a lot of what goes on around us, and we have no idea that we are missing so much. So next, um, in terms of attention depleting tasks, all tasks that require a form of self-control. And here is an interesting thing. Suppressing our feelings and emotions is mentally demanding task that may may make your mind switch from aware driving to autopilot driving. Examples, responding nicely to someone's bad behavior. Or, as Roy Boyne's studies show, pleasing other people. In fact, that study showed that pleasing people is a very mentally demanding task. So if you're trying to solve a puzzle or prepare your report or solve a problem at work and you are attending to the needs of your loved ones or your colleagues at the same time, you're not doing a good job. Your attention will be depleted. Your mental energy will be depleted. Any um, avoiding difficult thoughts or any thoughts that bother us where we have this internal conflict will deplete your mental energy and your ability to think clearly and logically. And as you can see, with every mentally demanding cognitive task, our ability to think clearly and logically depletes. And that's natural. Next, fatigue. Physical, emotional, perceived, and mental. As a matter of fact, a few dreams will have the same effect on your mind as sleeping night. And in terms of that, hunger and low glucose blood levels. Again, our nervous system and our minds need glucose so that we can think clearly, sharply, and maintain the focus. So here I'm going to ask you to do another puzzle. Um, so I'm going to show, this is a simple puzzle, a quick one, but listen to your intuition again, the answers that come to your mind first and second. How many animals of each kind did Moses take into the ark? 
now. Some of you might be thinking, okay, elephants, giraffes, all of them, then you remember, oh, it's actually pairs. Two of the right? Wrong. Because Moses did not take any animals to the ark. It was Noah. So this is a very simple intuitive puzzle, which is called the Moses illusion, which introduces a familiar idea. Right, animals being taken into the ark sets is biblical context, and um, Moses is not unusual to this context. He's not abnormal yet; it is an abnormality. But here is the thing: remember that intuition is recognition. So our mind naturally searches for information we already know, for what we recognize, and first of all reacts to that that context, ignoring the subtleties, the abnormalities. So next item is familiarity. And this one is deeply wired in our brains and minds. This is how we evolved. You know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, when we come across something new and it doesn't kill us, so we label it as safe. The more often we come across it and the safe of it fails, so we know like, ah, okay, so it's good. Familiarity creates a cognitive sense of comfort and ease in our minds which is very difficult to differentiate from truth. I'm going to say it again. We are not built to recognize and differentiate between familiar and the truth. Think about it. Next one, you're not going to like it, good mood, um, or what the scientists call optimism bias. Uh, studies actually show that when we are in a good mood, we are in our comfort zone, familiarity puts in, we are better tuned with our intuition and creativity, but our ability to solve puzzles, to perform analytical, statistical analysis and tasks declines. And vice versa, if we are in a bad mood, then we get disconnected from our intuition and creativity, but we, get, we become much more vigilant, so we become much better at analyzing things and detecting abnormalities and subtleties. Not good news, but this how this is how things are. So all of these things will deplete your attention. They will deplete your ability to think clearly, logically, and detect abnormalities. And the thing is, all of these are effectively used in social engineering and manipulation. Whether it is to prey on your sense of comfort and trust, or um, on your sense of stress and your fatigue, or perhaps by putting you in a time pressured, conflicting decision situation, which is which happens very often. So there are a lot of people who will use this to manipulate you to make the decisions you don't want to make. As so it's very important to understand these factors. And it's good to know this, but then again, what can we do? Right? How can we cope with this? How can we become better drivers being aware of this? First and foremost, our brains, minds, bodies need frequent rest and balanced eating, diet, glucose. The key word is balanced. Too much glucose consumed to fast results leads to energy spikes, which leads to rapid energy decline. It's not giving you anything good. Um, on this topic, I want to mention there was a study conducted um, with two people, uh, groups of people working on cognitive tasks, and one of them had a drink with glucose sugar, and another a group had a drink with a sweetener. The group that had a drink with glucose, actually sugar, performed much better on their following task because they were able to overcome this energy depletion effect. Sweeteners do not give us energy, unfortunately, for those who are on the diet, these are bad news, but sugar makes us better thinkers. Again, in balanced way. Positive incentives. Another study, again by Roy Boymister's group, showed that when people had a strong incentive, they were able to overcome the energy depletion, attention depletion, ego, um, ego depletion effects. So motivation is a powerful thing, and these are not just words. Our minds need it. We do better when we are positively motivated. Practice recognizing those situations where we're most likely to switch from aware driving to intuitive, automated, easy, quick, lazy thinking driving. When you start practicing those, you will start noticing the situations when you are more vulnerable, and that gives you the edge. Um, any practice, any skill, just like with driving, takes time. So start now. 
if you want to improve your intuition. Next one, just learn to use both. There is a reason why 95% of our time we use our automated thinking system because it saves energy and because it gives us those important insights, intuitive signals. So it's important to learn how to do both. Delegate solving some problems to your intuitive thinking system productively, but also verify, check, check the facts mindfully. And train your attention. Training your attention leads to training um, intuition. And here is a little incentive for you. Scientists found that improved attention links to improved intelligence. And in fact, training the attention improves cognitive control and our ability to think logically for longer resisting distractions. But that comes with practice. So going back to my story with my website um, on the spam messages, subscribers attack, what helped me spot this attack while my team did not? Well, first of all, I was rested. It was Sunday morning. I had no distractions. Second, I had a strong incentive. It's my website, my business, my reputation at stake. Third, I followed on my intuition hunch that suggested to me quicker than I realized that people don't work on Sundays and that that subscriber's email address looked slightly oddly different from all test emails that I saw. And I took action. I had plans that Sunday morning, but I put them on hold and I started investigating. I overcome that familiarity um, bias to look into things because I didn't want to trust the lazy thinking system being in a good mood on Sunday morning saying, ah, oh, I will check it later because I have plans. So cognitive biases are built in us. They are in our nature. They are our built-in vulnerability. And there is nothing we can do about it but just be aware and practice recognition and practice getting better at our intuition and attention. Here is a famous Muller lear illusion. We all know the two lines are equal but you still see them different. And that's the thing, as Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner said, we can't unsee the illusion, but we can train our minds to recognize it. And just as the case with an idiot on the road, we cannot be responsible for every idiot out there, but we can reduce the number of accidents by training our attention, training our intuition, by training our ability to quickly and productively switch from autopilot to aware, focused, thinking mode. Um, and that's all. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we have time for a few questions here before we break up. So, Tanya, thank you very much for that. Very uh, thought provoking. Hopefully, my attention's not too much depleted, but great. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Yes. So you know it. Have you had the same vulnerability? Yeah. Um, the thing is, at the moment, there is no other website that would have vulnerability. And that's the thing about in India driving on the road. We don't know when it's going to happen, when a cyber attack is going to happen, when someone is going to do something that will put our lives, businesses, reputations at stake. All you can do is be vigilant, continuously check whether another website gets much better at cybersecurity and switch quickly. Can you transfer all of your data, all of your corporate to another website quickly without losing it? Yes, every day. That was the point. And I think that's why I got it resolved so quickly within a week. I was sending reports every day with all screenshots, notes, timing. I wasn't taking it lightly. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah. So that's hard to say. We said they don't, but then again, uh, the fact that my card was hacked and used in California just a few weeks after that, um, so that was an odd thing to happen. And I believe there are no um, coincidences really. Any more questions from the floor, folks? I have a question, actually. Did anyone get the 5P response straight away? With the task? No, everyone had... Did you have one? Oh, oh, but did you get the 10P first? And then they were like, oh, hold on a sec. Something just nerded up. 
All oh, right, okay. Ah, oh, you know the puzzle. Okay, that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing exactly, yeah. You know it's illusion, so you can recognize it. That's the thing about recognition. Practice. Yeah. yeah. But you still see it as different, that you can't do anything about it. That's the thing with um, the cognitive biases and illusions. You will feel it. You will still feel it every time. It's just overcoming it, that building up this resistance to pause and say, hold on a sec, I'm switching my driving modes now. Okay, big round of applause for Tanya, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.